Welcome back to Built to Last. Today we're in Chicago, Illinois to find out why the city's water system was built to last. Chicago, the city on the lake. And like a lot of cities on lakes, Chicago is surprisingly water poor. Oddly situated on the second largest Great Lake, Lake Michigan, but also very close to the Continental Divide, very little fresh water drains through the city of Chicago. This is the story of how Chicago conquered the challenges of its topography and massive growth to take advantage of its geography. Chicago's story is unique among cities that solved clean water problems in the 1860s. And I'm going to share with you the monumental effort that still serves Chicago today, a concept that was built to last. In the early 1800s, Chicago became the boom town of the West as its water and later rail transportation made it into a hub for east-west travel. Now, a major challenge for the initial iteration of Chicago was that it was situated low in a swamp, not much higher than Lake Michigan itself. This lack of elevation made it difficult for waste generated in the city to get away from the city. And as the city continued its explosion of growth, finding and sustaining clean drinking water became a real concern. By the 1840s, the city had been plagued by several cholera outbreaks from drinking water, and the source of which was either shallow wells drilled into the high groundwater table or water hauled directly from the polluted lake or river. So right, at this time, the city didn't even have a sewage collection system. And what sewage did drain away entered the stagnant Chicago River, which was basically an open sewer conveying all sorts of nasty offal from both humans and packing town that Upland Sinclair so aptly described in the jungle. So in 1854, a cholera epidemic wiped out nearly 6% of the population. Something needed to be done. The city turned to a civil engineer from Boston, Ellis Chesbro. 43-year-old Chesbro came to Chicago in 1855 and brought with him the credentials of having designed some of Boston's first water system from experience gained at the b &O Railroad and from working with John Jervis, designer of New York City's Croton Aqueduct. Chesbro found a massively expanding city that had very little drinking water. Chesbro, like many of the best engineers that I've worked with, had this ability to separate the solution from the problem. And as an engineer, I've encountered many situations where a client comes to me with a solution that they want to build. However, what the client wants and what the client needs are often two different things. And Chesbro was brought in to construct a water system, but he recognized that the sewage problem had to be addressed first. So Chesbro really shows us genius here, looking beyond the obvious solution to solve the real problem. Chesbro proposed a three-stage strategy of epic proportions. First, raise the entire city to a height that permitted the construction of sewers with sufficient fall to actually drain the city, roughly 14 feet. Next, deepen and channelize the recently completed Illinois and Michigan Canal to convey the wastewater away from the city and to the west, into the Mississippi River. Chesbro got the city raised and the sewers built, but couldn't garner the support for modifying the canal during his days. Using knowledge that he gained in his European trip about the Thames Tunnel and brick sewer construction in London, Chesbro began planning a five-foot diameter intake tunnel. And the intake tunnel would run two miles from an entry shaft sunk near the end of Chicago Avenue to the intake crib sunk out into Lake Michigan. Construction of the intake tunnel started in March of 1864 with the sinking of the land shaft that would become the low service pump station. The excavation work was performed by hand with three shifts working around the clock. Now work needed to proceed at near nonstop pace because the clay excavation phase could only stand for about 36 hours before having to be supported by the double lined brick and cement filler. In May of 1864, the construction of the intake crib commenced and tunnel construction then began working westward toward the already in progress tunnel from the land. With careful and constant surveying, the engineers were able to join the two tunnels in November of 1866 with less than 10 inches of air. An amazing feat and testament to the technical capabilities of the 19th century engineer working with plumb bobs and transits. Work then proceeded with the low service pump station and the upgraded high service pumping station at East Chicago and Michigan Avenues. The pump station was built in a Greek Revival style using Joliet limestone, resembling more a castle defense than what we'd call a pump station today. The choice of architecture is no accident. 
the water system defended the city of Chicago's existence. And inside, three massive steam engines lifted water from the low surface piping and supplying pressure to the city's new water mains. Across the street from the pump station was the equally impressive standpipe, also ornamented and housed similarly to the Chicago Avenue pump station. The Chicago Water Tower. Inside, a three-foot diameter standpipe that served to buffer the pulsation of the steam driven pumps, keeping pressure in the system relatively uniform. The combination of the lake tunnel, intake crib, pumping station, and standpipe, and distribution mains formed the complete water system. When the Great Chicago Fire struck in 1871, one of the only structures that was not destroyed was the Chicago Water Tower, which stood as a symbol of survival and solid construction that inspired Chicago to rebuild. So, what made this first Chicago water system built to last? For this one, we really have to look at Chesborough's contributions to the project. First, clarity of purpose. Chesborough was able to focus on the problem of obtaining reliable and safe drinking water, which required him to first solve the sewage problem ahead of the clean water system. Secondly, the entire system was constructed with redundancy in mind. All of the pump stations were fitted with multiple pumping units, as we've learned to do today. Pumps are mechanical systems that inevitably need maintenance, and of course these pumps too would have to be taken out of service. This is a sad fact that any one of us with one car will attest to when we're bumming rides. Third, the system was planned to maximize future capacity. At the time Chesbro was planning the water system, peak demands had hit 7 million gallons per day. In true 19th century engineering fashion, Chesbro doubled that and planned the system for a peak of 14 million gallons per day. And last but not least, Chesbro came up with a design that was very simple and it just worked. Simple design has a robustness that no amount of computer-aided design or even today's AI can replicate. There's an elegance to following the path with the least complexity, and that path has been well worn by the city of Chicago over the years as they've added other intakes and tunnels, but all built on that original Chesbro concept. Today we can look at the remaining 1869 water tower and pumping station as more than a monument. It's a reminder that real progress is measured in not how fast we build, but in how long our work endures. So the story of how a city turned its greatest vulnerability, water, into its defining strength is the story of the Chicago water system. We're reminded that the best engineering doesn't solve just today's needs, it prepares us for the next century and beyond. The Chicago water system saved a city in need, and the Chicago water system is most certainly built to last.